If you're just loading it up and opening Chrome and working in Google Docs and Gmail, yeah, it's simple as. And that's why it's great to like give one to grandma because they can't break it. They can't go out of the Google walled ecosystem very far. Why do I need a business account? It seems like Google is like that. Is that accurate? It's just a matter of going to a folder right clicking and going to make available offline. Okay. It's very cool, yeah. We are back with another special episode. Now this episode we're calling a newbie episode because my colleague who I'm about to introduce, Todd, has in his words, some very basic questions, which I think having seen the notes are very pertinent questions for anyone who wants to better organize their digital life, who wants to get more out of the Google platform and the Google ecosystem. And you know, maybe if you're someone who's curious about Chromebooks, Todd was so curious, he went out and bought one, but he's opened it and he's like, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> so we're gonna cover some real basic questions and hopefully get some decent answers. Strap yourself in and I'd like to introduce Todd. Welcome, mate, great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining. Hey, Peter. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's do maybe a, a very brief intro on who you are, where you're from and, uh, and, and what we're chatting about today. Excellent. So uh, by, by profession, I am a, a college professor and I have a YouTube channel related to my topic of teaching, which is statistics and research design. Yep. So I have this cool little YouTube channel that I started doing just to post some videos for my students that has gotten a lot larger than I ever expected that it would. And it's called Research by Design, in case you're looking for I'm some open that on the screen while we chat. <laughs> the plug in for that one. Um, so uh, I have been doing uh, research using computers for a lot of years. However, I am not really familiar with with Google. So I grew up in the Macintosh world. Uh, I've been using that since the very, very beginning. My earliest exposure to, to Macintosh was the all in one machines, uh, the Mac SE, which I still have uh, over here. It's a it's a fish tank now. <laughs> but I I've never let go of that. So that said, I know computers. I don't know Google. I don't know Chromebooks. But I was really curious, really, from listening to your channel uh, about the the Google uh, environment. You, you told me what they call it, the Google ecosystem. Uh, ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, so that's how much of a newbie I am. I, yeah. I don't even know what to call it. But I did go. Uh, they had a sale. And I, I got myself a Chromebook Plus, and I thought this would be fun to play with. And I recognize the potential with it, but I really need some guidance on you have to think differently than you do in the, the Mac system. Things are located in some different places. There's some analogs between um, Google Sheets versus Microsoft Word, which is what I would use, uh, even though it's a Microsoft product, use that in a Mac environment. Uh, what's what? Uh, how does it relate to what I already have? Are these two distinct worlds that I should not try to cross or or do they communicate to each other? Uh, really, what are the advantages of having a of, of having the Chromebook and having the Google environment that that can really help me organize specifically my YouTube channel? Because you know Google and YouTube they're they're the same. Uh, everything that I've done on the Mac sort of crosses over into Google world, but it's never, uh, it, it's, 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 it's always that crossover. It's never integrated. I can see so many of the technologies. So I like, let me start with this. I, I, I buy the Chromebook. Uh, I've had a lot of fun exploring it. I have noticed I'm missing some keys down here. So I, I don't have uh, my, my, I have control alt and shift, but I should have a whole lot more. There's no function keys. I also note that this has like, uh, sometimes four, I guess, eight gigs of memory and, and a 512 hard drive, which hardly seems enough for anything. Uh, did, did I just buy a toy or is this <laughs> machine going to be, <laughs> is that enough to actually do anything real in business? Great question. Great question. So, um, yeah, so let's, let's start with like what a, what a Chromebook is and what, what a Chromebook is good for. And, and you may, you may, you may send it back at the end of this discussion, which is totally fine by me. I'm, I'm not attached, uh, either way, and I'm not going to try and, you know, pitch on something that you, that you don't yeah. actually need. So, um, I, I see Chrome as, uh, excellent lightweight devices that allow you to, uh, work deeply in the Google ecosystem and allow you to get work done without the distraction of a PC or a Mac. On a PC okay. or a Mac, you've got uh, pop-ups, you've got other applications, 
Uh, you've got, uh, they're designed for legacy software or call it legacy software, anything that's not running in the browser. Be polite about and it. yeah, and, <laughs> and the Chrome book and the Chrome, uh, I guess, Chrome device ecosystem, uh, but specifically Chromebooks or Chrome OS, that's really designed for stuff or workers where you're primarily working online. So really great for a CEO who needs to spend most of their time writing emails, maybe reviewing a handful of documents and sitting mm -hmm. on meetings and not much else. Okay. And they need a very secure, very simple, very reliable device that has great battery life and is never gonna die on them, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not gonna break, they don't have to reinstall any apps, they don't have to let stuff, they don't have to worry about uh, is Microsoft blah, blah, up to date or not? It just, it just works. So really great for that. Okay. Also really great, obviously, for students, right? Because students just need to complete homework, browse on YouTube, and uh, I don't know, probably check emails, free emails from, from teachers or professors or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So that makes it pretty straightforward as well. Now, in the business world, you're pretty new to doing things in the Google ecosystem. So it may be a bit premature that you've jumped into Chrome um because it's typically those that are really comfortable with the google ecosystem and pretty comfortable with doing everything the googly way that get the most out of chrome and you're not quite there yet mm -hmm. so let, let me ask about that yeah. one of the things i like about mac is that walled garden of i can get all of my software from the app store uh, I, I can basically avoid all of the riffraff out on the internet because i have this space in which i know that it's safe and it seems like Google is like that. Is that accurate? In a way, but then Google's a little bit, it's a little bit hokey in that some of the apps are, they were previously plugins. Now Google's killing off plugins and they have to be progressive web apps. Um, <laughs> or some Chrome devices, well, all the Chromebooks allow you to run Android apps, right? So you can get an Android app, but then what's the difference between an Android app and a progressive web app, like a web app that you've downloaded, right? Well, you know, now you've got a bit of a difference, you know, between how they operate and some of the Android apps are a little bit buggy on the device because they're designed for a phone, but now they're being expanded to a computer. So the experience is, is in theory, it's like the Apple experience, right? The Play okay. Store has a vetting process. It's not quite as rigorous as Apple, but it has a vetting progress for process for what, for what goes in the App Store. The security is top notch because it's all locked down to your Google account. And it's a highly secured device and operating system. So on that basis, yeah, it's it's excellent. Do you get the same customer experience or user experience that you get on a Mac? Well, it's a bit it's a bit different. If you're just loading it up and opening Chrome and working in Google Docs and Gmail, yeah, it's simple as. And that's why it's great to like you know give one to Grandma because they can't break it. They they can't go out of the Google walled ecosystem very far. But then some people would, you know, will plug in a USB stick and you can you can get a movie file there, right? But natively in the Apple Finder, you can edit a video or you can trim a video. You can work with media and Chrome OS leaves a bit to be desired with things like that. So the moment you want to put your engineering type hat on and start to do some video editing or, you know, editing photos or anything like that, you can get it done, but it's not the it's not the kind of experience that you would be used to having come from the Mac world. So let me spring off of that. Yeah. Uh, as a as a teacher, sometimes I want to show how something is done on a screen. Yeah. Uh, for, for me, I'm opening up my Mac. I'm opening up SPSS statistical software, and I'm showing you how to do an ANOVA. Let's say I want to do that on my Chromebook. And I don't expect to do all the editing. I'm going to bring that back on the Mac side and do that. But can I do screen capture of, of, of uh, the whole screen or even uh, a, a snapshot of the screen that I could use for editing later? Absolutely, you can. Yeah. So you can capture screen. There's a, there is a built-in tool which works reasonably well. You could also use something like Loom, which lets you capture your screen. So either of those are going to work just fine. That's, that's, not, a, that's not a problem at all. Okay. That sounds good. What, what are the limitations on, on just the, the amount of memory and the amount of storage? Is that, well, it, are, are those limitations or am I just using the standard of, of uh, you know, 32 gigs of memory on my MacBook Pro and saying, oh, four gigs? How do you even survive in that world? Yeah, look, four is a little low for any device these days. 
only because Chrome is very hungry. Now the Chrome operating system is much more lightweight than Mac OS or Windows OS. So where you might wanna have eight or 12 these days as an absolute minimum on a Mac or a PC, I would argue if you're a power user, you'd wanna be going to like 16 or you know 24 even. Um, with a Chromebook, if you are a moderate user, I would still be recommending eight as an absolute minimum. You will get away with four, but the moment you open more than five or so tabs, you may start to feel it slowing down. And it kind of depends on what you're doing. You know, if you're just in zero.com or QuickBooks Online doing your accounts, and then in another tab, you've got the news open, and then in another tab, you've maybe got your Gmail, that's probably fine. But the moment you're on a Google Meet, and you want to do those three things at the same time, okay, maybe you'll start to feel it slowing down just a little bit. And okay, Google Meet is using graphics as well as just processor, but um, you know, bit by bit, you're going to you're going to start to eat into that. If you're a, a business owner, I would say eight gig is probably going to be the minimum. If this is a casual device that you're just using when you're on the go, and you you know you get to your office, you sit down at your workstation to do your more serious work, maybe you get away with it, just sitting in a cafe and just doing your emails. Four gig will be absolutely fine on, on a Chromebook. It's when you start to multitask or do multiple things at the same time, that's when you'll start to feel four starting to lax, lack a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm gonna guess the the little device behind you on the, the what looks like a TV stand has gotta be a Google device because as you started speaking about Google, it often lit up <laughs> and then the, the line started moving. So I guess it was it was listening. Oh yeah, like, that's, that's, uh, that's an old, Google, I've got to be careful using the G word now, but it's a Nest yeah. speaker. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're, these are discontinued, but um, that's a really nice speaker. If you can find the the next, the Max Hub, I think it's called now. Uh, but um, if you can find the Max speaker, they're, they're a nice speaker that sits there. So let's, let's please keep going with the Chrome questions if you like, um, but when you're ready, let's move into, um, uh, yeah, let's move into Gmail and, and Google Workspace as well. One last question about about that, which would be, uh, so I, I noticed on, on my Safari browser on my Mac, it has a thing that stops trackers. It only to track you from what side. Yes. The, the most common tracker that gets, that gets flagged is googleamanager.com. Uh, point being, Google seems to be really interested in where I'm going and what I'm doing. Uh, am I giving up privacy by using the Chromebook Plus? Great question. Short answer is anything you do on the internet, you're giving up privacy. And most things in Google services, you're giving up privacy. Google have been, uh, look, Google run the internet, right? And the reason Google have all the money that they do is because we we use Google and they track us everywhere we go. That's, that's it, end of story. And they have this, you've got to be careful using the M word because I'm a Google partner and I've <laughs> got to be careful I don't get into trouble. Um, but they have this this way of owning so much of the landscape of the internet because people like me who want to advertise on Google have Google's pixel on every website, on every asset that we own. Right, right. And right. therefore, you go to my website, Google can see you're on my website, and they're, they're collecting your data there. Now, mm -hmm. that's going to happen whether you're on a Mac or whether you're on a PC, unless you're very, very sophisticated with using both a VPN and a... Um, browser that's not giving tracking data over. Uh, and that's a very valid path if you care very deeply about the idea of advertisers or Google themselves tracking mm -hmm. what you do online. My personal choice is I don't really care that much because I like shopping recommendations. It's pretty useful for me. And I know that Google doesn't really care that much about me as an individual. Like they don't care what's in my profit and loss statement. Mm -hmm. They don't, you know, they don't care uh, what I sent in my in my instant messages to to my friend or my partner. They mm -hmm. don't care, right? They care about the aggregate behavior of many many people. And yeah, sure, they care about advertising to me, but um, that's about it. They care about my profile. They don't really care about Peter Moriarty. So, yeah. to me, I don't mind. But for many people, they have. A, you know, a real problem with that. And that's fine. That's a, that's a, that's a personal choice. And they, they don't wish for their data to be collected without their consent. Now, mm -hmm. where it gets scary, and I've got to be careful not to put, you know, tinfoil hat on here, but where it gets scary is where that collection of data coalesces with overreaching governments. 
We have one of those. Yeah. Oh yeah, well Australia does too, and uh, you know, and there there are many there are many around the world. Um, and 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 so the issue there is, um, and there's a there's a uh, uh, not yet a case, but a, an issue with Apple and iCloud, where Apple made this amazing encrypted iCloud, which no one could get into because it was end to end encrypted, right? And the uh, UK government said, well, if you don't let us have a backdoor. Um, then, uh, then uh, you know, you, you you can't run the software in our country, or they were going to find them, or, or or something. And so they they've actually had to disable that end to end service, rather than mm-hmm. comply, which is a good move on Apple's part, right? Mm-hmm. But what that exposes is governments are very very interested in where they feel and deem it's needed getting access to your data. Now, that starts to give me a little bit of concern. To be honest, I'm changing my tune on that a little bit about how much data I want to give to advertisers. Do I care that, um, you know, like Google saw that I was shopping for a hard drive or a printer today on Amazon? Mm -hmm. No, I don't care that much. But, uh, you know, what about the photos that are sitting in my, you know, photos? Uh, You know, if a government decides, hey, you know what, we don't, we don't like this, we don't like this Peter guy. Let's, uh, you know, let's see what, let's go and see what's in his photos because Mm -hmm. we need to. I'm, I'm probably less com- I'm probably less comfortable with that because my photos give my geotag location where I was at a certain point in time on a, on a certain day. I don't have much to hide, but anyone can build a case with enough information if they if they choose to. So on that basis, you've got to choose, okay, how much information do I want to give Google? Now personally, I use Google Photos. I do use Proton Drive, which is a fully encrypted end-to-end encrypted drive service if there's stuff that I think, hey, maybe that's not, you know, maybe that's not something that I want someone who's looking for dirt to be able to find. But I mean, with most things, like if it's on a computer, someone might be able to get in. I mean, I trust WhatsApp end-to-end encryption calls, but mm-hmm. outside of, you know, outside of proper end-to-end encryption, I, I don't trust much. I gotcha. Uh, and even Facebook say that when you send a message to someone in an oh. encrypted chat on Messenger, they may decrypt the chats for safety reasons or if there's a request from law enforcement. So um, you've got to be real, you've got to be real careful with that. I got you. And I, so I'm not too, because I, I lead a quiet life, so I don't have too many exciting photos. Uh, right. But I understand the uh, the ethos of uh, you give us the man, we'll give you the crime. Yeah. Uh, I don't really want you know, too many prying eyes there. Going back to Google proper, yeah. they I guess so they do have access. So I, I write something I, in a Google Doc and I have it on my drive. They could access that but I, i'm getting they're not scraping that for information that they're using for any other purpose is that good question not- there's there's a distinction between personal consumer accounts and business accounts here because okay. personal consumer accounts that you're using for free are fair game your emails really? your behaviors everything has been collected and google's using that and, and that's how you'll see advertisement in your gmail based on insights and data that's gathered on you. Now, is it reading your individual emails? I'm not 100% sure, but effectively your data is, is, is fair game. On a business account, Google are very clear that they won't use your business data and they won't use your business behavior to advertise to you or to build a profile on you. They might use your web browsing history, but there's a button you can switch on and off um, for that. And it's very, very clear if they're using your, your history or not there, or if you're saving and giving them your activity. Um, but but that's that's an important that's an important distinction. Now, catch more of Todd in part two of this video. Don't miss it.